Hi there, folks. Welcome to a long overdue episode of this Robotech thing. Now, uh, this episode of this Robotech thing, uh, I have been shooting and reshooting for about a month now. And uh, the specific um, focus of the episode at the end, uh, the review of issues one through eight of Titan's uh, Robotech comic book series from 2017, 2018, uh, that portion is about two years overdue. Um, but oh, the funny thing about coming back to this over and over again over uh, the last month is um, our top story here uh, keeps evolving. And uh, let, me, let me just take this from the top. So uh, you'll recall in the last episode of this Robotech thing, I was talking about the wonderful, glorious uh, new age of Robotech and publishing. Well, I spoke too soon. So in late January, uh, the Diamond Comic Distributors catalog comes out uh, for items shipping in April. And while there was a new issue of Robotech uh, solicited, issue number six of Robotech Remix, uh, the issue was actually missing from the solicitations sent out by Titan Comics to uh, comic book news sites. And I wondered, well, is this just an oversight? Because we have we have covers, uh, we have, you know, this is up on the the Diamond website. Um, it's up on the Titan website. So, uh, what's going on? And nobody says anything. Then uh, about a month ago, the new Diamond catalog comes out for items shipping in May, and. Robotech uh, number seven is not even in the catalog. Now, the Robotech Masters trade paperback, uh, collecting the entirety of the Kamiko Robotech Masters comics, including the Dana Story special, was in there. Uh, later in the evening, after I had discovered this, uh, I got an email from the uh, shop I order my comics from saying that's um, orders for issue 5, uh, which should have been out this month, um, had been cancelled. So that is, you know, 5 cancelled, uh, 6 not in solicitations in the catalog. The question for the last month or so has been, what's up with Robotech Remix? Well, we got some funny things here. Um, when I first asked the question, um, the remark was made by the Robotech Union China uh, Twitter account that um, uh, it's COVID-19. Um, at the time, the only real disruptions that had uh, thrown into the world were disruptions in China. And uh, the remark was made that uh, COVID-19, um, you know, it's causing disruptions in China that were affecting uh, Titan's ability to publish the book. Um, thing is, um, all of Titan's comics appear to be uh, printed in the USA. That, but that said, I know that uh, a lot of um, specific kinds of paper uh, do come from China. Uh, but again, now, so... Uh, <laughs> If it disrupted Robotech, uh, the question is, well, then why didn't it disrupt some of their other publications, like uh, like Doctor Who, like Blade Runner? You know, I'm still getting issues of um, uh, Rivers of London. Um, so, I mean, valid question there. Um, you know, it might be published in the USA, but, you know, the paper might be sourced from China, but, you know, then Titan does have other publications all coming out. Um... So, that could be it, but I was looking at the numbers that day. I was looking at the numbers of the last four issues of the 
original Titan Robotech series. And the first four issues of Remix. And I don't have the numbers in front of me. I wrote them on a, sl a little slip of paper. I've tried to keep track of it for about a month, and I don't have it at this point. But I I'll, um, I'll be looking that up. And uh, right here, you should see a graphic uh, sort of showing you know, uh, all of those numbers. Uh, the thing I remember off the top of my head is, so it had uh, sort of settled into um, a level in about the 5,000 copy range. And it had got a bump, a uh, first issue bump uh, from the first issue of Remix up to about 8,000, but then it very quickly leveled back to the 5,000 range before issue 4 plummeted into the 4,000 copy range. Um, so it lost like an additional 500, 600, whatever uh, orders. And remember, these are these ICB2 numbers uh, for comics. These are sales to stores in the direct market. They don't reflect sell-through. So what happens with these numbers is you know, the direct market stores, the uh, comic book shops, the local comic book shops, you know, order two months ahead to take a wild guess how many people are going to want this thing. And then, you know, they're on the hook for that. And if they've got too many copies of this sitting in their store, then they make the necessary adjustments, you know, to, you know, the next issue and the next issue and the next issue. So clearly, you know, something has been not clicking uh, for uh, readers with uh, Robotic Remix. And, I mean, I'll really, we'll really get into this um, sometime in the future, uh, what that might be. But, I mean, there's any number of reasons, you know. It is very stylistically different from uh, the previous series. You know, it focuses on Dana Sterling, you know, the first Robotic War is over, um, you know, uh, with, and then, you know, we even had a Event Horizon which, um, you know, dealt with the Invid, uh, you know, and that's all behind this. It's new villains, you know, it's a new style, and, you know, it's the protagonist of the part of the series that, you know, I'm not going to call it the weakest part of the series because I am a, a, a huge fan of the Robotech Masters portion of, of uh, the Robotech saga. But, uh, you know, it is the part that has the smallest fan base. So, oh, you know, uh, any number of these could be the reason why a uh, remix just wasn't clicking in the same way, um, you know, as the previous Robotech series. Um, that said, there's a key word in, you know, the cancellation of... Robotech Remix number five will be resolicited. The intent is to resolicit. Uh, so we shall see. Now, as fate would have it, so I had every intention of, of sitting down and reporting this um, segment here um, again uh, last Friday. And as I'm pondering this, um, I'm selling stuff on eBay. You know, I sold off, uh, you know, just a few, uh, Robotech knickknacks and among all the other things I was trying to get rid of. And the Robotech knickknacks were, of course, the thing that sold because, you know, yeah, that, yeah, that usually happens when I try to, you know, get rid of, uh, Robotech stuff. Um, and one of the things was a little Van Presto Claudia figure and somebody, somebody bought it. I'm like, Okay, cool. Uh, last second bid. And then I take a look at the screen and I'm like... Really? 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 I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here getting ready to, to, you know, shoot this little thing here, um, you know, talking about Robotech Remix, and Brendan Fletcher buys my uh, Claudia figure. And I think to myself, it would be awfully gauche of me to uh, 
insert a little note that said, Hey, hey, what's hey, what's going on with Robotech Remix? Uh, why, why, it's been canceled? I, I didn't do that. I, I didn't, I, I did not put a little note in his box that uh, asked that question. But, uh, <sighs> I mean, it wouldn't be my life if, if these things didn't keep happening, uh, would it? I mean, it would, it would just... It would almost be weird for these for these things to just not keep happening, you know? These these just these little these little things that just remind me just how how damn small the the world really really is. <laughs> so today, today's Monday as I'm recording this, and uh, two more wrinkles in all of this. So somebody actually finally asked, um, because Titan posted up, um, a link to an interview with, uh, with Brendan Fletcher, and somebody asked, this is point blank, what's going on? And the, uh, person running the Titan, uh, Twitter account says, we have a, we have an announcement about Robotech coming up, stay tuned. So, I guess we'll stay tuned. Uh, meanwhile, uh, due to uh, COVID-19, uh, the coronavirus, um, Diamond Comic Distributors uh, is going to cease shipping new comic book product to comic book stores starting next week. Uh, so this week's shipments are the last for the foreseeable future. Um, so these two announcements were made on the same day. So are we going to be announcing, you know, the future of Robotech Comics when no comic books are, are shipping to stores? Whoa, who knows? Nobody knows. Nobody knows what's going on at this point anymore. Um, uh, everything's weird. Uh, weirder than usual. Um, so I guess we'll stay tuned for all of this. Yeah. Um, so let's flip to a more positive, uh, more, more, you know, feeling good note. Um, so this also... Uh, came out last month, uh, news uh, during the same weekend that the uh, New York Toy Fair was going on. Uh, Mep Toys, who um, have up to this point made that uh, fairly cool um, Brie Tai figure, uh, an approximately 100th scale, uh, which I still don't have mine. It, mine's still sitting in uh, warehouse, warehouse of Big Bad Toy Store, waiting for me to accumulate enough things uh, to make it worth my while to ship a, a box. But, uh, so their next figure, uh, you'll recall, is going to be at the Invid Scout. Um, and Met Toys have said that once factory production starts rolling again, um, for their, the factory they're using for that, um, it'll be about 45 days, uh, to, you know, make the production run for that. Now, uh, that hasn't, I have not seen a pre-order for that anywhere yet. Um, I wonder if they're not going, just going to, to say, look, we've got them in hand, go for it. Um, but they announced the next project after that, which is the 148th scale three-form Veritech hover tank. friend of mine, I, I, I seem to recall, did muse about, you know, this turning into another, you know, Lucy pulling away the football situation for me. Um, because as with any uh, self-professed fan of the, uh, the robot designs of Super Dimension Cavalry Southern Cross, a.k.a., you know, the Robotech Masters, um, you know, I've been dreaming of a proper three-form Veritech hover tank for so long. You know, I have... One moment. Uh, this old guy here. I do have two-form one. This is, of course, the Playmates one. This is the one I've had since the 90s. It is um, a bit yellowed, but, you know, all the plastic's still good. Everything still works.
all of the joints. Still nice and tight and clicky, and none of them are sticking in any sort of way that makes you uncomfortable doing anything with it. Out come the guns, out, come the, out comes the little control panel. Now, the take the bad excuse for a rifle, turn it into its proper, you know, and it assumes, of course, um, you know, gladiator configuration here. Um, but, of course, no hovercraft mode. Now, people have been clutching this into a hovercraft for years, and now, finally, they're going to, you know, Meptoys plans on making a toy that means you no more clutching. It's going to actually turn into the, uh, the hover track configuration. Um, in the past couple of weeks, they have shown off photos of it with other, uh, with the other key Veritex from the other two generations in 148th scale, which does go to show just how tiny the hover tank actually is compared to the Alpha and the Valkyrie. But, yeah, and, and seeing that picture uh, did bring to mind um, the horrendous scale of the old Eternity Robotech comics, where they would have a, uh, a hover tank and a Valkyrie sort of going toe-to-toe -to -toe in uh, battle mode. Which is just, it's kind of hilarious when you actually see the proper scale on these things. And they're back to Battleload. I do still like this toy quite a bit. And, you know, the new one is certainly going to be much smaller than this. I think it's going to be about this size by comparison. But, you know, I, again, uh, just getting one that actually does all the modes is going to be just, just fantastic. Um, I can't remember if they've uh, given a date for that, but given that the Invid is probably going to be sometime in the summer, we're probably looking at at least, you know, at the earliest, like Christmas, um, if not early 2021. And of course, toy dates slip. I mean, toy dates just slip. You know, look, look at how slippery uh, Kit's Concepts dates have been. Now, of course, again... You know, all of uh, this toy manufacturing is, is clearly, you know, getting, um, you know, pushed, 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 you know, due to uh, uh, COVID-19. But, you know, it's still, you know, uh, even when things were good, uh, kits, concept dates, you know, kept slipping. Uh, Map Toys, you know, ran into the bad production, you know, the production problems with their first run of free tie. You know, things happen. But, uh yeah, I, you know, I don't mind. I'll, uh, I will happily wait as long as it takes, um, you know, to get one of these that actually turns into, um, you know, hovercraft mode. And, you know, presumably it's also going to have a little bit extra joining. Although, you know, I mean, as, as things go, the, the joining on this one's not bad, especially for this line and for this age, the age of the original mold. You know, seeing as this dates back to 86. But, yeah. So, you know, uh, the future remains bright for um, fans of Southern Cross, so long as, you know, everything else doesn't, uh, you know, blow up and melt around us in the interim. So, um, boy, um, plan right now is to flip to an interlude um, to look at some other you know, toys, much more recent than this. Uh, you know, take a quick survey of some things. Um, one, one item that recently came out and, and a few of its friends. And then after that, we will get into the nitty gritty and uh, talk about... Um, uh, talk about some Brian Wood and some Marco Torini and some Simon Furman um, working on the old Robotex back in uh, 2017 and 2018. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll sort of talk about uh, why it's taken me two years to uh, uh, sit down and talk about uh, those books. So, um, on to more toy stuff. Fun fact. When a person spends 
eight hours during a day working from home, the last thing that they want to do once they've done that is do more work. So, uh, I told you in the previous segment, it was Monday. Uh, this segment, it's Thursday. Um, I've been working from home Tuesday, Wednesday, and today. And the only thing that's uh, driving me to actually sit down and record is the fact that uh, if I don't, I'm going to have to dump the uh, previous footage and then re-record everything all over again. And uh, I've already done that a few times. So we're going to push on through this. Uh, this episode is going to probably then go up on Monday. because. Um, and, you know, if you're watching this, then you know what day it uh, went up. But uh, that's the hope, that's the dream right now. Uh, so for this segment here, um, we're going to take a look at uh, a few recent acquisitions. Uh, this was the, this is the most recent uh, Macross acquisition I've gotten. Uh, the Heimel RVF4 Lightning in uh, uh, Flashback 2012. Uh, Skull Squadron colors. Um, now, I've been buying these high metal R's for a while, uh, but like this one, you'll see, I mean, nothing has been moved. <laughs> God, look at that beautiful thing. Actually, let's just, just, let's just bask in the glory of this beautiful thing. But I haven't broken this out. I haven't transformed it uh, because I don't have space for all of my high metal R's yet. Uh, I've got shelves and you know, display spaces and flat surfaces covered with toys but uh, I do not have I do not have a nice space to set up a nice um, display of my, uh, my Valkyries here it's it's frustrating uh, because well let's take a look we got some more we got some more Valkyries here we got uh, this is, these are not recent acquisitions. These are things that have been boxed up forever that I still haven't had a chance to take out. Um, the uh, 35th anniversary um, Messer Color uh, VF1S. I love, love, love the blue of that Valkyrie's visor. I love the pink detailing. Um, of all of the versions of the 1S, this is like the easy one to get. Um, because, of course, this is the color scheme from a character from Macross Delta. This is not canonical to uh, uh, Macross TV or movie, um, but it, it still looks cool. I, I picked this up simply because it just looks so sharp. I love, I love the colors on this thing. You know, I've never gotten, so I don't have uh, a uh, high metal R. Uh, Roy colors, I don't have a high metal R. I don't know what other um, pilot colors they've done the 1S in, actually. Um, but uh, but I do have that one. Um, I do, of course, have a um, cannon fodder, the F1A, here. Again, the, 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 like the tape's still sealed on these. Uh, I've never opened them up. Um, the 1A, I, I, I like that for the 1A, they actually gave you the two different kinds of hands, the sort of mechanical do you remember love hands and the rounded uh, uh, car, uh, TV series hands, as well as the two slightly different uh, head sculpts. Um, but I, I always kind of wanted to get a second one of these, you know, just to sort of have uh, somebody sort of, you know, have their little squad with them. But, uh, you know, it's never, it's never been able to get into the budget. Likewise, I always wanted to get one of the uh, Regalts, a second Regalt. But uh, have you seen the price for a Regalt uh, High Mill R online lately? It's like 250 bucks. Um, and worse if you decide, oh, you know, I just kind of wanted a missile pod. Um, the, there was a two pack that uh, was a Tomashi Web exclusive that had the, the two different kinds of missile uh, attachments. And. Ooh, like, mm. Those were expensive to begin with, and they're much, much worse now. But I do have one, just as well as I have the uh, Glog. And the Glog is open because 
When I got this from Ami Ami, I got it. The box showed up in this condition. Um, and you know, normally I don't order things from Ami Ami. Um, I would much rather uh, order from HLJ. Thing is, uh, Macross stuff. You know, this is all Tamashi Nations, uh, you know, Bandai stuff. Most Tamashi Nations Bandai stuff you can order from someplace like uh, Big Bad Toy Store or Entertainment Earth or, uh, you know, or even Amazon. You know, all of these companies carry all of these things. But of course, because it's a Macross and because, you know, this is, a, this is, you know, official Big, Big West Macross. Yeah. You yeah, know, there's no U.S. distribution, so... Anytime any of these things shows up on, you know, the Japanese sites, you know, it shows up at whatever stupid hour they post this stuff, and then, you know, there's a run on it, and, you know, HLJ's always out first, and then, uh, if you're lucky, you can order from AmiAmi. But, yeah, that Lightning, got that from AmiAmi. Um, but the Glog, Glog actually comes with a stand. Glog is nice, Glog is big, Glog is detailed, Glog is lovely. Glog's got uh, two antennae in case you lose or break one. Um, but uh, again, this is this got opened solely because, yeah, the, it, the box shows up and it looks like this, and it's just like, uh, yikes. Um, oh, damn, yeah, the lightning. The lightning also actually came with a stand, which I was stunned about. Just stunned. Yeah, yeah, there's the, there's the stand, because most of the stuff, I don't think, comes with the stand. Most of the stuff is just sort of like, you, you, you got one of those mechanical uh, Tamashii stands, right? You, you got one, right? You don't need it. And also, it's also weird, you know, like the, these two Valkyries actually, you know, give you the, the window, you know, uh, look in there, and um, window to peer in and, you know, look at your, your uh, guy, and this one doesn't, I don't I wonder why that is. Probably cost saving measure. <laughs> Maybe that's how they could afford to put the stand in there. Anyway, um, enough blathering about uh, toys. Enough to sort of cursory glances over, you know, uh, odds and ends, things here and there. Let's talk about the Titan Robotech series. So here we are on a blue skied and breezy early Sunday evening. Uh, almost a week now since uh, that first part of the video was shot. And um, unless I have made uh, the severe sort of edits I'm thinking about, um, you are probably feeling it by now. So uh, there is no, no time to waste here. Uh, let's get into two years in the making. Um, the This Robotech Thing review of issues one through eight of Titans, uh, recently concluded uh, Robotech ongoing series. Uh, issues one through four, written by Brian Wood, uh, drawn by Marco Torini. Uh, issues five through eight, uh, written by Wood with Simon Furman, uh, still drawn by Marco Torini. Uh, collected as Countdown and Bye Bye Mars. These issues uh, adapt episodes one through ten-ish of the Robotech television series uh, with some major changes. Uh, the reason I have put this off for two years is because I didn't want to be a bummer. I didn't want to come in here and rain on anybody's parade. I know full well there are individuals involved uh, with these issues who follow me on social media. Oh. Um, and I just didn't want to, I didn't feel like putting that negativity out into the world uh, was a net positive. But, you know, I promised it two years ago, I'm going to go through with it. and. The fact of the matter is, issues one through four of this series are bad. They're really bad. They're really, really bad. Um, those are a loose adaptation of episodes one through six. Um, and they match up pretty uh, one to one. Uh, issues one and two covering um, booby trap, countdown, space fold. 
uh, issue three covering the long wait and uh, issue four uh, combine the events of transformation and blitzkrieg omitting some of those events uh, for the sake of the new narrative that they're creating um, that's really where some of the changes come in that's where the book kind of gets interesting as opposed to just sort of it's just the Robotech TV series, except not as good. Um, it does sort of bring me back to my question of why adapt the Robotech television series in 2017 and 2018 when it was actually streaming on almost every major platform out there. Especially when they're doing not as good a job of telling the story as the TV series did. Um, Certainly, as it veers further and further off course, the book becomes interesting. Uh, the changes become interesting. Um, and certainly by that time, the writing has gotten better. Um, still seems like a strange exercise, but uh, you know, some of these changes make it feel kind of worthwhile, uh, at least to a long-term fan like myself who has been starved for, like, new Robotech uh, since forever, it feels like. Um, but what makes 1 through 4 so bad? Um, one, uh, Wood's dialogue is appalling. Um, as somebody who liked several things that Brian Wood has written over the years, this was a major disappointment. Um, from Roy Foker's uh, cringe-inducing tough guy dialogue on the opening pages, um, you know, to him acting like an asshole to Rick, uh, even though that does get explained by the changes to the plot later on, it still feels like, you know, oh, it's the Robotech you knew and loved growing up, except everybody's a dick now. Um, the chatter uh, among the bridge bunnies um and then you know minmay's dialogue uh at the chinese restaurant at the very beginning of the book is horrible and a lot of the narration reads like he went back and watched some of the more bad examples of the robotech narration and decided to model all the narration on that you know it just reads like this is based on his memories of the show being kind of cheesy, badly written, and uh, you know, uh, he's not really trying to bring it into uh, the 21st century like the uh, interviews suggested he was trying to do. Uh, once Wood is off of scripting, once Simon Furman comes on, the dialogue gets much better. And that's strange because uh, Furman's good, but I never looked at him as like a naturalistic, you know, dialogue for young people guy in the same way that I thought of Wood as. Um, but it looks like it seems like that, you know, that sort of skill set is entirely unnecessary in this version of Robotech because all of the sort of things that I would think would play to Wood's strengths are things that are largely omitted. Um, you know, uh, the adaptation of The Long Wait in issue three um, is steered largely by the fact that Wood has sort of fundamentally changed Lyndon May's character. Um, he has made her a more assertive character. As such, uh, he's damaged the contrast between Lisa and Min May, but because of one of his big twists in issue four, uh, that sort of changes Lisa's role anyway, which makes events later on in the series not actually make any sense. In doing so, you know, this more assertive version of Min May, you know, isn't as scared as the Min May in the long way. Um, and she's, you know, a little pushier with Rick. And you never get that same sort of sense of intimacy between the two that grows. 
that Rick finally, ultimately, sort of feels like is pulled out from under him. Uh, and that just, it just kind of, uh, that's kind of a load-bearing piece of Robotech to me. Um, that is a load-bearing piece of Macross. And in changing that, it just sort of changes the emphasis of the series and just makes it another sort of sci-fi series. And, uh, you know, it reduces that sort of, you know, the sort of heavy love story element of the series. Which, again, that was the whole part of Robotech I was interested in seeing Brian would handle. So, you know, the fact that he's out, of, out the door <clears throat> by, certainly, totally, by the end of all of these issues, but he's, he's got one foot out the door by the end of four. Um, you know, so, uh, not, not actually that disappointing, um, you know, considering uh, how badly bungled the thing. Um, now, the twist. The twist, of course, is, you know, twofold in, in issue four, in his last full issue. Um, one, he showcases the fact that of what he meant in interviews by, you know, actually adhering to Carl Masick's vision. Um, you know, he's instituting a version of Carl Masick's time loop, which would have been a major element in Robotech 3, The Odyssey. You know, the fact that when the SDF-3 fails to arrive uh, at Earth at the end of the new generation, uh, you know, in the last two episodes, episodes 84 and 85 of the TV series, uh, it winds up going back in time. And the SDF-3 ultimately becomes the SDF-1. And, you know, so the show can air as a Mobius loop. You know, the SDF-3 finally returns to Earth, so, you know, as the SDF-1 crashes into the Earth, and that takes you to episode one of Robotech. Uh, later on, when we finally sort of see this in this series, uh, Furman kind of upsets some of the details, but that was the original idea. And uh, as such, in issue four, when Foker and Hayes explore the ship, you see characters in Robotech the Shadow Chronicles, you know, uniforms all throughout the ship, and that's why the ship, had, you know, all the computer systems are in English and everything. Um, and then he does something that veers the whole series off course, which leads to some of these, you know, this not actually becoming what uh, Wood was selling to begin with, which is he kills off uh, Captain Global at the end of issue four. That means, as of issue five, Lisa's the captain of the ship. Because, as of course, as we you know recall, Specifically in Robotech, uh, Lisa is treated as the first officer, which in a funny way goes back to like the original uh, you know, uh, premise for Battle City Mega Road, you know, and, you know, the earlier draft of uh, Macross, which was supposed to, which was more a comedy series and was going to have a uh, you know, female captain for the ship. Um, although, as I recall, that captain character was going to be a little bit hapless because comedy series. Um, I don't know if Wood is enough of a Robotech and Macross nerd to have made that connection um, and to have done that specifically, but you know, it is a, a cute little bit of, you know, A cute nod, even if it wasn't intended as a nod. <laughs> um, again, this is, this is sort of how the thing becomes interesting, even though it's not very good. Um, but it's not just Wood who drops the ball. Um, it is Marco Torini. I feel like Marco Torini was poorly cast on this book. Um... Around the time these early issues were coming out, I actually took a look at his Marvel work, which was a uh, Squadron Supreme miniseries written by Howard Chaikin, based on the version of the Squadron Supreme 
that uh, J. Michael Straczynski and uh, Gary Frank created in uh, a book called Supreme Power. And it's a very talky sort of book. It's, you know, a lot of sort of grounded superheroics, um, you know, with sort of a pseudo real world vibe. This seems to be the sort of place where um, Torini would excel. And it, it very much looks like the same sort of work, even though it's like 10 years earlier. You know, he hasn't really stretched or evolved in those 10 years. Um, With Robotech, he basically has to do, you know, this a big sprawling space opera, as opposed to a, a sort of talky, you know, uh, syndicated TV series. And that's the problem. It turns Robotech into a syndicated TV series. It looks like Robotech, the Sci-Fi Channel original series, you know, <clears throat> right down to the fact that the acting and emoting isn't very good because it is limited by the photographs of models and actors that he has access to. It, uh, yeah, the same faces are repeated throughout. You see the same Roy Foker grim face over and over and over again, sometimes flipped this way, sometimes flipped that way, but it's the same face. There's a there's one page in issue one where you know, uh, Lisa's face is repeated twice on the same page. You know, these are distracting things. These are things that sort of pull you out of the experience, or at least pull me out of the experience of reading. Now, I am not a fan of photo traced comics anyway. But you get an artist like that doing a book like this, and then they also have to, you know, create something, some of these sort of more fantastic elements, and you can clearly see, like, the Zentradi battle pods are all quite clearly traced from stills from the TV series, because on the same page, you know, they're all slightly different shapes. His redesign of the VF-1 or if he didn't redesign it, I, I think somebody else, I think I remember seeing somebody on Facebook saying, oh yeah, I'm the one who, you know, sort of rejiggered the VF1 for this. Um, you know, not credited, clearly. Um, but the redesign of the VF1 uh, never looks good. Um, the arms are way too spindly, and the battleoids are horrific. I think you only in these eight issues see uh, Veritex in Battleoid like twice, maybe three times. And that is a wise course of action on uh, Wood and Furman's part because the uh, Battleoids are an insult to Shoji Kawamori's design work. They look like really janky knockoff toys. Um, they're ugly as all heck. Um, you know, Rick and Min May sort of have that sort of odd reaction that you see in the TV series in Countdown in issue two when Skull Leader comes down, and they just look stupid for having that reaction because. Skull 1 looks so appallingly ugly in Battleoid. The one thing a person hired to draw Robotech should be able to draw in a way that is cool is the VF-1 Valkyrie. And the fact that they hired Torini to do this without being able to do a competent Battleoid is a major editorial failure. Um, the SDF-1 is clearly uh, traced from like a 3D model, so are the Destroids. Um, you know, uh, Torini pours a certain amount of, you know, sort of scritchy inking on, you know, for his shadowing, for his shadows, uh, that is not present on the, uh, the Destroids or the uh, SDF-1. It looks like, you know, they're like 90s CG models in a syndicated sci-fi show. Yeah, it 
it never looks right. It always looks slight. They always look slightly out of place. Um, and these are failings that go on throughout his run of issues. Um, I almost, as long as he's the artist, don't have to get into the art. Um, you know, going forward because these are the same failures you're going to see over and over again. Again. I'm not really going to knock him because he's just doing the things he clearly does. Uh, this is more than anything a failure of Titan editorial than a failure of Mark Arturini. He's just not built for this. He's, this is just not what he does. Um, and they should have just gone, oh, we need a different artist. I can only assume they hired him because they wanted a realistic Robotech and because he could get this work done by deadline. So there's that failing. Um, I think the last thing I'm going to actually say about uh, 1 through 4 is um, Rick getting in the Destroid for the Daedalus maneuver stupid and pointless and is just one last bad um, addition to the story uh, on top of you know every other failing of those four issues it's just dumb why how does he know how to pilot that thing I don't I don't know I don't know I don't know um, Five through eight does some interesting stuff. Uh, once Furman comes on, yeah, you know, <clears throat> he's he's changing up things uh, quite a bit. Um, I expect this is again, you know, probably modeled, on, you know, based off of plotting by Wood, but you know, we really don't know who did what for those for those four issues. Um, you know, what is what Furman brings to it. I know it's Furman on dialogue, uh, and the dialogue's much better. Um, you know, the dialogue is nowhere near as rock stupid. Um, you know, Furman always comes in with a, a, you know, a certain amount of cliches, but at least, you know, it sounds like actual human dialogue. <laughs> it sounds like people. You know, people do talk in cliches. It's, you know, um, and nobody's saying anything as thunderously idiotic as anything it said in those first four issues. Um, a lot of the business with uh, sort of the Britai Chiron interplay as well as Roy playing detective trying to figure out you know who killed Global uh, reminds me a lot of uh, Bill Spangler's Return to Macross from the mid-90s. It reminds me of those books in a way that uh, I enjoy. Um, and the embellishments to buy by Mars, Lisa sort of running after, you know, uh, signposts posted by a holographic uh, Cal Reaper, feels like the sort of things that anybody who was now, or even as early as the 90s, sort of trying to embellish that story would put in there. You know, make it, you know, have that hologram have it be sort of a ghost story. I kind of like that. Um, you know, it, it really is, it is the changes to the material that I really like. And I, I, I'll give Wood a certain amount of credit for that since he was apparently still plotting at this point. Um, you know, it's just kind of a shame that you come to this from those horrible, horrible first four issues. You know, I, and I, it drives me bananas. It drives me so crazy when you do have something like this that gradually over time gets better and better and better, but starts from such an abysmal starting point because you kind of then want to recommend, oh, but it's it's okay later. Um, you know, just, just don't read the first four issues. You kind of want to say that. You don't, just, just, just don't read those. Those are bad. But, uh, but you know, I, I, for somebody 
new to the series, those are essential. You know, those do provide uh, necessary groundwork. You know, um, they're so bad. Oh god. You know. This is why I didn't want to do this two years ago. I didn't want to just sit here in front of a camera just, you know, going, that they're so bad. And yet, I, that's, that's, that's where we are. That's where we are. Those first four issues are awful. They are not the worst Robotech comics ever published. Um, you know, there are some, there are some real gems uh, that were put out during the Academy years <clears throat> from 94 to 96. Um, Antarctic Press put out some really insulting books uh, back in the late 90s. And uh, Robotech Voltron, again, is just, is just trash uh, with, with lovely art. Lovely art. Um, you know, issue 4 was fine. Um, it was encouraging. But it comes off as really, really bad after issue 5 comes out and just flushes everything down the toilet. I, I would rather sit down and reread this than um, actually seriously sit down and read that series again. Um, but the fact that, like, the writing on 5 through 8 is okay, but the book is still ugly, um, you know, it, it's not makes it something I would don't actually enjoy like thumbing through in the same way that you know I can sit down and just sort of lay out uh, an issue of Robotech Voltron and go look at the pretty pictures look at the pretty pictures look at how pretty they are look look at them yeah you know, the, the problem is that you know we're, it's comics words and art need to be in concert for a book to be good and uh, as Robotech Voltron fails in the word on the words and plot front, um, as long as Torini is on the book, uh, Titans Robotech, you know, always fails on the art front, always. So, um, yeah, uh, if you have not yet experienced the um, uh, Titan Robotech comic series, um and you've been sort of waiting for, you know, say, me to come along and finally tell you, was this any good? Was this? Um, no. 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 Um, if you kind of want to dip your toe in, um, you know, if, uh, like a digital copy of Five is on sale, Maybe just get that, or you know, maybe even uh, if like Bye Bye Mars entirely is on sale, you know, download that and sort of see if you uh, see if it intrigues you. Because again, you know, some of the some of the changes are intriguing. I mean, that was the thing that got me through all of these issues was, you know, when four came out and the twists were revealed, and I'm like, oh, this is interesting. This is interesting now. It's not just a retread of the series with bad art. And, um, you know, <clears throat> bad takes on the characters. So next up, uh, next up is going to be um, a kind of redundant episode of uh, Turbo Saga, since uh, the PC Engine Mini is out and people are actually reviewing that hardware now. Um, I'm still going to go through the rest of the uh, catalog for that for the the system, you know, um, but we'll we'll really get into that um, at the beginning of that episode, and then I am going to do basically an editorial episode of this Robotech thing, um, you know, before the next uh, comic review, and. Uh, it's, it's something I've been kind of wanting to talk about for a few years now, and it feels like a good time to have that discussion. Um, so, um, yeah, this is uh, your pal Captain JLS signing off. I'll uh, see you guys later. <laughs>